So ladies and gentlemen, uh, our conference continues with this very interesting panel discussion about the new realities facing startups in Silicon Valley and in the greater Bay Area. It's especially interesting for me since Accenture Technology Labs in San Jose is a central hub for Accenture's technology R&D organization with four other locations around the world. At the labs, we are focused on exploring new and emerging technologies to create a vision of how technology will shape the future. And then we create the next wave of cutting edge business solutions, working directly with clients and leveraging the practical experiences of our global network of technology professionals. Our open innovation program serves as a bridge between the global 2000 clients and the startup community, many of whom are of course in the Silicon Valley. We help our clients directly engage with the right startups quickly and with less risk, helping them capitalize on a wide range of emerging ideas with the first mover advantage. Silicon Valley is of course the land of startups. Our entrepreneurs are what they make of us and have been this way for 70 years. But for much of our history, Silicon Valley startup community was able to do what they do without running into the buzzsaw of federal regulation or social unrest. When you're making software or electronics, that makes everybody happy and productive. There aren't many controversies to mount. But today, many of the startups are venturing into some sensitive or hot button areas and their disruptions are raising tough regulatory questions. Some of them are even causing social disruption. So our panel today is going to take stock and see if we can make sense out of all of this. It's a panel filled with amazing people who are founders and disruptors and we wanted to get a very representative sample in front of you today. I'm going to introduce them very briefly to you now, and please, by all means, read their profiles in the printed program. First is Sam D. Brower, left, and she is the co-founder of Scanadu. It's an amazing story, and I hope she'll share with us today but she has had a life-altering family emergency a few years ago, and it motivated her to, you know, revolutionize home medicine. Scanadu is literally building the tricorder that you have seen in science fiction movies in all episodes of Star Trek. Our next panelist is Ben Nelson, who I know personally for my HP days, and he is disrupting the field of education by founding the Minerva Project. He'll tell you more about it, but he is set out to do nothing less than reinvent the university experience. He used to be CEO of Snapfish, so this guy knows how to see a company grow from an idea, in this case, the world's largest personal publishing service. The next company on our panel is Loyal3. Talk about another disruptor. The company is democratizing the capital markets out there. How? By making it easy and affordable for people to do their own investing and choose the brands they like to pay most without paying any investor fees. That includes even IPOs made available at the same price that brokers get on Wall Street. It's amazing. Now your program indicates that the CEO, Baddy Schneider, will be on the panel today representing Royal Three. But yesterday, he learned he had to take a last minute trip to New York. So I would like to introduce you instead to Jeff Modisette, who is the chief legal officer for the company. And he used to be the attorney general of the state of Indiana. Jeff, thanks for being at Get Sprout. Our next panelist is from Lyft and talk about a company getting a lot of attention. You already know that Lyft is disrupting the transportation sector big time. It's trying to navigate through some thorny regulatory issues and getting a lot of friction from established transportation providers. 
Veronica Juarez is the person at Lyft who is on point with the public sector, and she has helped the company enter more than 50 new markets. She'll be one of the voices on our panel articulating the public sector, and she can do it because she has been on the other side of things, previously working in the federal, state, and local government. Thank you, Veronica. Our last panelist is my colleague, Jitendra Kavatekar, who's going to be the big picture, picture guy at the panel, talking about broader ecosystems. He's good at that. He heads up our open innovation practice at our tech labs, and he works at the intersection of startups, venture capitalists, and universities. Before turning over to the panel, I want to tell you about our moderator. We thought it'd be best if the moderator were a founder and a CEO. We also wanted a person who understands policy and process. We also wanted a moderator to be somebody young, working in San Francisco, and completely plugged into the sin up there that we are talking about earlier this morning. So we found our guy, and he's also a member of the Joint Venture Board. His name is Matt Mahant, and he's CEO of Brigade, a technology company launched in 2014. He is trying to mobilize the internet and social media to change the way we practice democracy in this country. Very well connected to what uh, Dr. Barber just talked about today morning. So Matt, you've got a lot of fun ahead of you. This is going to be a very, very interesting discussion. It's now in good hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prith. What a, what a great intro. I, I will try not to be too repetitive, but I did want to note that, just to help kind of frame what we're going to talk about here, we are in the midst of an incredibly significant consumer internet startup boom in this region, as you all are aware of. And I use the word boom, not that other dreaded B word bubble, <laughs> very, very intentionally. Um, and there are some really significant differences about the startups that are getting funded and finding traction today. Um, some of the obvious things are that they're often built on social and mobile platforms that did not exist 15 or 20 years ago. Another is that they are reaching millions of paying customers and generating tens of millions, hundreds of millions, in some cases billions of dollars in revenue. So I think they're going to be here for a while, which is exciting. Um, and, and third, the, the topic of our panel today is that a significant subset of those consumer internet startups are tackling big, complicated industries that are heavily regulated and have typically been considered to be public sector or public good industries. And this was not the case 15 or 20 years ago, or at least the ones that did aren't around anymore. So today we're seeing success and traction in companies that are taking on big, regulated public sector industries, which I think is one of the most interesting and probably underreported trends going on right now in consumer internet technology. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the company that I co-founded, I should just say a quick word about, is, is trying to tackle one of those industries. Our goal is to build best-in-class social and mobile technology to help citizens and voters identify themselves as voters, connect with one another into networks where they can organize and apply social pressure and recognition to ultimately mobilize and to turn out to vote and take other actions in blocks to restore citizen power to democracy. So to add one quick shameless plug, we are actually still in stealth mode, but we'll be releasing our first beta product in two months. And so for everyone in the audience, if you would like to get on the beta list and see it first, you can go to brigade.com slash SOTV, State of the Valley, SOTV, to sign up for the private beta. So why don't we jump in? We'll start with Sam here. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear, why don't we start by hearing from each panelist about one really significant challenge or obstacle you've had to overcome and your company has had to overcome in bringing your product to market. Uh, <coughs> so first, our products are not um, into the market yet. <laughs> we oh, are we're in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> we're seeking FDA, cl FDA clearance. However, we are shipping our first product as investigational device, so that's very exciting. But um, Clearly, um, uh, you know, developing products in a, in a highly uh, um, regulated um, environment is very challenging, but 
this is a great opportunity as well. Uh, we knew it from the beginning, so it's very challenging because um, as a startup, it's, it can be heavy, all the processes, the documentation, the audit trails, the people you hire have to have, to have experience. So the myth of being 18 years old, drop out, no experience, no, it's not really true uh, in, 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 in what we do when it comes to medical devices. Um, so clearly it has these um, uh, big obstacles, but I think that's the great thing about a startup, we look at it as a, an opportunity. Um, it's really giving us traction, it's making us better. Um, it's heavy, but and it takes more time, but at the end it pays. Um, uh, you know, uh, Minerva is a, a very different kind of, of startup. We're, we're effectively the first Ivy League caliber university launched in the United States in over a century. And by far the biggest obstacle, frankly, was the beginning. It was actually getting people to suspend the pattern recognition. I actually had a venture capitalist tell me, you know, I don't understand your pitch because I'm trying to pattern match and I can't pattern match it. And I, I failed to point out to him that in order to actually have above market returns, you must not pattern match. But that's a, uh, that's a different uh, conversation. But <laughs> it, w I think the world that you see today in Silicon Valley is, is very new. Um, if you went and went back to 2010, Lyft and Uber, I don't think, existed or were just about to start. Um, you didn't have the kind of uh, recognition that Tesla is going to be such a success. You're not going to have, you didn't have the, the kind of recognition that you can go after big, challenging problems and tackle them. And you compound that with even made people who are uh, all for disruption are excited about disrupting industries. They're excited to disrupt any institution in the world, but when it comes to their alma mater, all of a sudden, you know, bleary-eyed, uh, drunken hazes come back <laughs> on, their, on their eyes. They say, well, it was so perfect. I mean, I didn't learn anything, and it was crazy expensive, and uh, it, was you know, it was really just a weird experience in, in, in that shelter, but it was great. It was the best time of my life. You can't get better than that. So it's... It's uh, it, the initial getting off the ground was actually the by far the biggest barrier. Okay, great. I think for Loyal 3, uh, just to make uh, clear exactly what we do, we make uh, the most popular stocks, publicly held companies, um, based on Facebook likes and other criteria. And we put them on our site and we sell their stock uh, for no fees at all. No fees to buy, no fees to sell. And we also do crowdfunding for the IPO markets. So we make IPOs accessible to the everyday investor. Uh, two very powerful ideas. You're asking about uh, challenges, uh, and I'll two real quick ones. The first, because I think it's a good example of how you can look at regulation as a positive if, if you approach it the right way. The first was we had a big deal with, uh, with NASDAQ. We were really going to be taking off. And all of a sudden, the next day, uh, all of these traders were calling up NASDAQ saying, if you do business with this new company, we're not going to trade through you. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, <coughs> I used to be a state attorney general, so I had some idea of who to call. <laughs> and uh, we left it alone, but suffice it to say that uh, uh, just a few months later, there all of those companies had to sign consent decrees to leave us alone. Uh, so the regulators were definitely our friends. The other example is that it gave us an opportunity to think more about IPOs, which we hadn't up until then, and we became a broker-dealer. And based on some experience that uh, Chris Kelly, one of our directors, and I had working with Facebook, you know, the MySpace and others were really getting uh, a lot of scrutiny because there were so many sexual predators, they thought, on the website. And at Facebook, we decided we're going to be proactive. We went out and visited with all 50 attorneys general and told them what we were doing, how we were protecting kids, and, and it was a, a really good experience. Um, and they seemed to really like that we did that, and uh, so Facebook didn't have nearly the problems that a lot of other sites had. So at Loyal3, we decided we're gonna go to the SEC and tell them what we're gonna do, and we're gonna talk about it from the very beginning. So we go to the SEC, the platform's not built, and we said, this is what we wanna do. And as you can imagine, there are 20 attorneys from the SEC, and they're all saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. They pull out ancient commissioner's letters and no-action letters from the 1950s, and you name it. Um, 
and it was really going south for us. And then our CEO just, you know, we didn't want our CEO to talk. You know, it was just lawyers, right? And finally, he just <coughs> said, look, I, I've got to say something. And he started talking public policy. What were our goals? How we wanted to protect investors, give them the same access that the big guys had. And technology is coming, so let's work together and let's come up with best practices. And you could just see the mood in the room change automatically. To make a long story short, uh, they agreed to work with us. Uh, we've had over a dozen meetings in the last year and a half with the SEC. They even have a loyal three team within the SEC so that we can go through the IPO review process much quicker than any of the other underwriters. And we consider them true collaborators in our platform. That's great. What a great story. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Um, so about our obstacles, uh, a lot of you will probably be pretty familiar with a lot of our obstacles since they're well documented in the press. <laughs> um, but I will, I will expand a bit. You know, I think our, our biggest obstacle um, over the last couple of years has really been education. So really educating folks about what we are trying to do and what we're not trying to do. Um, so we're not trying to replace existing transportation industries. We really see ourselves as a part of the solution to the entire transportation fabric, to you building your own personal transit system that works for you. 80% um, of all seats in personal vehicles are empty at all times. So you know when you're driving on your commute, you see you maybe you're in the car by yourself or one other person, but you'll see on the road most people are driving alone. Um, our long-term vision and mission is that we are able to connect people along similar routes so that people are changing their behavior and starting to carpool in a real time every day to go to work, to go run errands, to, to do whatever it is you're doing in your daily life. Of course, along that way, we have been you know, caught up in um, a lot of existing uh, regulation for an industry that you know, I really believe has been traditionally over-regulated. So again, there's been an opportunity for us to create you know, a new way of looking at our model and how it's different. Um, but we've also you know, opened the conversation you know, when we're having these discussions to say, well, well, maybe the way that you guys have been doing it you know, with existing transportation providers is also not the best way. Um, because you know, there could be a new way of looking at that so that that system remains or can become even more efficient. Thank you. Well, you know, Accenture is not a startup anymore. Uh, we're about uh, over 30 billion in revenue, 300, over 300,000 people now. But, uh, you know, we play at the center of this uh, ecosystem of startups <coughs> and our global 2000 clients. Uh, and if you look across our 19 industries, um, there's massive shifts going to what we call digital, which is technologies being used, uh, technologies like analytics and big data um, Internet of Things, um, lots of different methodologies, uh, sharing economy and those business models and social models and how these trends are transforming each of these 19 industries. Industries could be oil and gas, could be healthcare, could be banking, uh, just across the whole gamut. We work with governments as well. So in that transformation, our clients are looking to find who are those technology companies that are going to help them make that transition. Who's actually innovating in these areas, Internet of Things and others? And so they come here, they come to Silicon Valley. And they come looking at companies like yourselves and looking at ways that they can partner uh, with the startups here and the universities uh, to look at ways to give themselves a differentiating edge as they compete in their own industries. And so the coming to the challenge of this is um, how do we help our clients go beyond the you know, first stage of um, admiration for Silicon Valley and New York and London, these ecosystems, Bangalore, uh, Beijing, you know, Tel Aviv. How do we go beyond the, you know, executives show up, they eat at the Google cafeteria, go to Facebook, uh, go talk to Scanadu, um, and uh, have some wine and go home. How do we get past the kind of tourism part? How do we get through the phase of, hey, we want to set up a corporate venture arm, or we want to do an accelerator. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to have an outpost and have two people here to kind of scan what's out there, maybe set up a small lab, still having a chasm to actually make any difference to their core business. How do we move beyond all of this to 
fundamentally, what does that client need to do? What does that large oil and gas company need to do to transform their business in a big, big way? How do we help them understand what the future is? How do we give them a roadmap to get there? And then how do we go find the right partners, whether it's in Silicon Valley or any of these other startup ecosystems around the world, how do we partner with them and guide them through that disruption that they want to go through? And so the hardest part for us is to keep up with the demand. Mm. Like I said, every industry is going through these changes. And then secondly, to help, help them go through that maturity curve of being infatuated by this to really making something happen in a big, big way. So who's a model for this? Is there a particular company you'd point to? Model isn't a client. Yeah. Telstra in Australia is a great example. Uh, we worked with Telstra for um, a couple of years, um, an ongoing relationship. We have a co-innovation model. They want to serve their small, medium businesses and their commercial uh, clients in Australia. And so to do that, they need to bring innovative services to, to the market. Um, where do these innovative services come from? Well, it comes from eccentric tech labs. It comes from ecosystem partners in Australia and Silicon Valley and others. Um, and it's a sustained uh, engagement. It's not a infatuation, like I said, right? It's not a, hey, I want to come to Silicon Valley, be inspired, I'm going to go back uh, to, to my home office and hope I can change the world. It is a sustained uh, process and disruption is not easy. It's a scary word for most people that are in a corporation. It's a sexy word for the C-level and the board, but it's hard to do. And how do, you, how, do you, how do we help our clients go through that? So that's an example, I would say. And Telstra is just one of the telcos that are doing amazing things. A lot of telco, telco is probably one of the areas that are very, very aggressive in terms of making these transformations. AT&T is doing it with their foundry. I can go on and on in terms of our clients. But. Great. So, so let's open this up a bit. So Jeff talked about partnering with the SEC. You have a loyal three team at the SEC who's got your back. It's incredible. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have guessed that. How do the other members of the panel think about regulators and regulation? Is it, a, is it a major impediment? Is it just kind of a nuisance? Could it be an advantage? How do you, how do you each approach regulation and regulators? I can, I can echo um, an element of what, what Jeff has, has said, and I think that regulation, um, a regulatory environment can be um, uh, a, a force for good or, or positive, assuming that you've got two things on your side. So the first thing is you have to have someone like Jeff, um, because frankly, without having somebody in the political sphere that knows who to talk to and who to call and, and how to actually get the right audience, then the regulatory environment is very difficult, sometimes impossible to navigate. So that's kind of the first assumption. The second assumption is that your product is unimpeachable. Now that's a good thing. It actually creates a scenario because we, have to r we think about regulation as this faceless, heartless Borg. But what it actually is, it's human beings. And, and when you can engage with them on goals, on what you're trying to do, right? Y you know, again, in our case, you can say, look, we're, we're creating an, a university which doesn't take a dime of taxpayer dollar, that cuts tuition by more than 75%, that is 100% seminar-based, that has higher standards than Harvard or Stanford, and that actually brings back the concept of a liberal arts curriculum in the context of a 21st century. Okay, so it's very hard for a human being to say, well, that's a bad idea, right? And so as long as you can present really a white knight goal, and that's really the purpose behind your company, and you've got the vehicle to broadcast that, then regulation can be your friend. If you don't have either of those, or if you don't have any, uh, any of those two things, Regulatory environments can be extremely difficult and very much non-conducive to incremental change. And that's actually one of the big problems of regulation environments. And even though the regulatory environment has been very good for Minerva, we've always advocated for a, an opening up of the accreditation system, not so that you need the perfect university to, to build in order to get through, but that you can create small incremental benefits and, and that other institutions can come aboard and say, look, we're slightly better than the existing incumbents in this way, but we should also have our, uh, our, our day in the sun. 
So, so for startups tackling that. heavily regulated industries, you need someone with the expertise of a Jeff, but you also need the, as you put it, white knight goal, the big vision for how this makes the world a better place. Right. Awesome. Okay. Veronica, do you yeah, want to jump no, in? Yeah, I'd love to build on that. Um, we launched in uh, Austin in May of last year. Um, drunk driving is a huge issue across the country, but it was particularly brought to light in Austin um, in the summer and spring uh, because they had a couple of incidents, um, fatalities, and they were having a just a really hard time actually addressing the issue. Um, the, p the police chief um, was very frustrated uh, with the lack of options that were available and said um, in the media that he wished that there were more options. Um, here comes Lyft. Um, you know, we, we approach uh, government and regulators in an extremely collaborative way. We, we feel that we have to um, and that uh, we should in order to, to build a long-standing uh, productive relationship. So um, after we launched, we looked at the numbers and within the first couple of months, uh, we saw all of the drunk driving incidents split in half from the year before. So I think another, you know, big, uh, you know, kind of factor in working with regulators is demonstrating the immediate value that you can bring um, to help solve their larger problems. That we are not the enemy, we are part of the solution. And if we work together, we can arrive at that solution to uh, you know, together. Our next kind of you know, way in which we're doing this is really working with airports. So you know, airports are a very complicated um, space. It's you know, complex to manage. There's a lot of traffic in and out. You have a lot of travelers. You have a lot of different kinds of transportation. It's at all times of the day. Um, but we have certain products like Lyft Line uh, that really puts people together along the same route and can immediately ease that congestion at the airport. So another great example of one another way that we could help solve a problem that um, they have. And, and yeah. um, where I, I'm coming from, mobile health is a very evolving uh, area uh, with the sensors, with the smartphone, it's really so you have, it all started with the quantify self, um, the wellness, the fitness. From the very beginning, we were very clear about the fact that we, we wanted to go medical. And um, again, we, we did build the necessary teams, regulatory, clinical teams, uh, QMS, uh, but we also approached the regulator and we said, we want to do this, help us regulate those products we are building because they are coming and people want them. Uh, so I think that um, this approach that we had at the very beginning, I can totally rely to what you said uh, uh, four years ago when we were uh, raising funds and we, we would say we had three, we have three pillars at the company, which is what we do is medical. Um, so that's the first red flag uh, <laughs> when you go and, 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 and raise money. The second one is uh, we need to build hardware. Uh, in order to become a software algorithm company to capture that data. Uh, so that, that was the second red flag. And the third red flag, we go in consumers. <laughs> so that was, uh, but again, I think that that's the right approach to go to the regulators and, and because it's coming. So uh, better work together. And in our case, so to come back to um, uh, the different processes we've put in place. The other element that is very interesting is there is us as a startup, as a team, uh, as a company, uh, they are the regulators and they are also the people out there. Your product is not available yet, you have prototypes and the people want to test it. And that's a new, that's a new trend coming, we saw that coming, so people contacting us, hey, can we help you build that device, those products, because we want to help, we need those products. And so we organized, um, um, a big crowdsourcing slash crowdfunding campaign uh, that was very new because we also had to put in place the proper protocols to be able to involve the people in the development in of the device, in the testing. Uh, so all those layers had to be also well uh, structured, well um, put in place um, in conversation with the regulator. I I I yeah, please. Uh, I just, just, I, I mean, I just underscore what you just said, Sam. I mean, I think the if you look at the FDA uh, and the regulation there, it's there to protect lives. I mean, it's not a trivial regulation, a regulatory body. And, um, and you counterbalance the, the weight that they have to, to protect our citizens. And you look at um, uh, VC funding of digital health companies, you know, being number two in terms of growth next to software. 
A lot of money is going into digital health companies and uh, startups out there, right? So counterbalancing these two is, is not a trivial um, you know, thing to look at. And the, the optimism in this is that while we might complain that things aren't moving fast enough, they are moving. And the FDA is, is looking at, at these new technologies and new capabilities and, looking at, and re looking at their, their uh, regulations. Of course, we can complain it's not fast enough but they're there to protect lives. And I think that counterbalance needs to be appreciated. Absolutely. So I want to get to market incumbents. And um, I thought Ben made a good point about venture capital we should come back to. But first, we have a, a, an interesting question from the audience, which is, is disruptive the best descriptor for startups that are complementing slash supplementing and changing existing industries? So do you, let's just quickly hear from a couple folks. Do you view yourselves as disruptors? Is there a, is there a different, mm. different descriptor you'd use? Why? We, we consider ourselves a disruptor, but we don't publicize it that way to, to, the, uh, to the industry. Uh, <laughs> we need the banks. Uh, we need to work with the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgans uh, and Morgan Stanleys uh, if we're going to be part of the underwriting syndicate. But I think they know that a 100% electronic platform not charging any fees, that's, that's disruptive. Uh, it provides access to a whole swath of the population that never had an opportunity before. So. When we are talking with them, and even talking with issuers, we don't use disruptive language as much, uh, but we certainly feel that way internally. We, we actually try our best. Uh, we, we don't think of ourselves as disruptors because the, the dynamic of a disruptor in, in industry, the idea is you come in with a product and then you watch as your incumbents just go out of business while you scoop up the market share. Right. And that is by definition not what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a model that other universities can then emulate and reform. Uh, and so uh, there's no kind of pithy term for it, but, um, but at least in the kinds of, it, you know, I, I don't think Amazon would really care if Walmart went out of business. I think that's okay, you know, they're trying to disrupt it and they're competing and if they take market share and they lose market share, that's fine. Um, education is not a market share game. It's, uh, it's a set of institutions that may compete for students or professors, but fundamentally rely on a rich and vibrant ecosystem. Our uh, concern is that if the industry doesn't reform, that the industry will then go out of business because it gets delegitimized. And so it, we, we think about it as in a very different terms. Yeah, well I would just uh, add, I, I threw out the word disruptor uh, earlier uh, and disruption, uh, and it is a pro provocative term, obviously, right? And it, it, it garners some attention. Um, disruption could be viewed as a new, a new player kind of takes out the incumbents and you know, disrupts the incumbent, but it could also be viewed as the, the new entrants are disrupting the way things are being done within a certain right. uh, industry like education, for example, or healthcare, or um, transportation. And that disruption is not only in the purview of a startup that has you know, eyes wide open and wet behind the ears and trying to go make something happen. That disruption is, should be uh, also in the milieu of the global 2000 companies. Why wouldn't they also think about changing their industries? Why shouldn't they think about that? You know, it's, it's hard, right? Innovators, dilemma, et cetera. It's hard, but so the disruption is happening at the industries is the way we're kind of looking at it. And how do we help our large clients navigate through that disruption and then themselves be disruptors in the process? So it looks like we're only gonna have time to go through one more question here. And I wanna talk about incumbency for a moment. So the, the Walmart, Amazon analogy is, well, I've always felt that that was a fair fight. Yeah, Amazon's leveraging the internet, Walmart has big box stores, but they've both kind of, they've got their platforms, and now obviously, it, but it, just, it always felt like a fairer fight than the industries you're in. When you think about health and education and finance and transportation, you have huge incumbents that are often very close to regulators and government and embedded in a, in a big, complex environment. What are, do, do you have advantages that maybe aren't obvious when you're taking on incumbents in a heavily regulated environment? Uh, I see Ben nodding his head. <laughs> Go ahead. Why don't you kick us off? Absolutely. I mean, the, the advantage is that you're dealing with incumbents that aren't used to competition. Their products suck. 
So, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's much more difficult for an Amazon to compete with Walmart that's had to battle Target and, you know, Macy's and Bloomingdale's and everybody else, right? When your youngest competitor is 124 years old, right, where their product has had no intentional design in the way that it's evolved, it's really easy to build a better service. Line of the day right there. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody else want to weigh in? <laughs> I, I think that uh, the, the incumbent bulge banks, they, they had tried to do some sort of crowdfunding on their IPOs, and they just simply didn't have the technology to do it. The most that they did was for the General Motors uh, IPO, and I think it was something like 65000 So the first thing that Goldman Sachs did when they wanted to look at us as well, can we work with these people was to load test us, and you know, we did $10 million in an hour. Uh, and they said, okay, I guess this is a better technology, mm -hmm. but the timing was right. And the other thing I was going to mention on regulation, sometimes timing is important there too. I think we got a big boost because while we were talking to the SEC, the Jobs Act was passed. And so they knew they were going to have to deal with all sorts of new issues, and they used us as kind of a sounding board as we went through the process. Great. So, Veronica, I think we're going to give you the last word. You are in a heavily regulated industry taking on some really interesting incumbents around the world. Do you want to sure. speak a little bit about that? Sure. I think one of the biggest advantages that we have is that we're, we're filling a real need. So you know, most families, transportation is the second highest income, second highest cost to their household income. When you look at lower income families, you're looking at up to 30% of what they're spending from their household income on transportation. So to be able to start to solve for some of that, um, for some of that cost is, is, is a huge, you know, a huge uh, problem. Um, we're also seeing that, you know, we're starting to solve that problem already here in the Bay Area. So if you look at San Jose, for example, 25% um, of all of our rides in San Jose are to or from the Caltrain station. So, we're solving a huge last mile for a small problem for commuters. If we're able to build that out to the number of these folks who you know, are spending so much money on transportation, who are being forced to move farther away from city centers and uh, to be able to afford to live somewhere where they can then have to commute to work. We just launched a new product in San Francisco and LA called Driver Destination, where a driver can select, this is where I'm going, and only see requests from people along the same route. Um, one woman in LA said she made $60 in two days on her regular commute going to and from work. So that's huge, and that's, and that's something that we certainly bring into the conversation when we're talking to regulators. Great. Thank you all. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Terrific.